Hi there, my name is Jason Harlow. I'd like to take you through the first three sections of chapter 10 of Essential University Physics by Richard Wolfson. And so the three sections are angular velocity and acceleration. We've got second section on torque, which is how you use force to get something rotating. And third section on rotational inertia and the analog of Newton's second law. And if you look at the quote from Richard Wilson above, you are sitting on a rotating planet. The wheels of your car rotate. Rotational, even molecules rotate. So rotational motion is commonplace throughout the physical universe. Even, even I might rotate. And you can see now I'm rotating about a vertical axis and my rotation plane is horizontal. Okay, so we start with angular position. So if we have some uh, circular path, uh, an object or a little particle on a circular path of radius r, we can keep track of its position either with the distance it travels, s, which is arc length, or with the angle that it makes with the center of the circle, theta. And uh, if you go all the way around, then s is 2 pi r. Um, the angle it can be specif specified in radians so that the it's 2 pi radians to go right in a full circle. And in that case we have a nice uh, equation to give theta in terms of s, the distance traveled, uh, divided by r, the radius of the circle. So it's good to, to use radians. And uh, keep in mind that one radian is 360 degrees divided by 2 pi, or about 57.3 degrees. This is about a radian right there. So now we talk about angular velocity. This arm rotates some angle delta theta in a time delta t. So its uh, average angular velocity, we call it omega, with a little bar on top to mean average, is delta theta divided by delta t. And the direction for positive uh, angular velocity is usually counterclockwise because we usually start from the x-axis and go up towards the y-axis. And then similarly to how uh, we did with regular velocity, the instantaneous angular velocity omega is the limit of the average angular velocity in the limit that uh, delta t goes to zero. So that's the same as the derivative d theta by dt. And it turns out that the linear velocity, v, that we're of particles on a rotating object is related to omega times r. So what that means is that as things get uh, further away from the axis, they're all traveling at the same angular velocity, omega, but the linear velocity, v, goes up uh, proportionally to r. It's going slowest, actually zero right at the axis, and then fastest right out at the rim. Next is angular acceleration. So imagine this uh, bar going around. It starts with some low velocity, and then as time goes by, tick, 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 it's going faster and faster and faster and speeding up. So that means omega is increasing as it's going. So there's a delta th omega. Uh, and over some time. So that means that's, that's acceleration, the change in angular velocity per time. So average acceleration is alpha with a little bar on top of it. And then similarly the instantaneous angular acceleration is the time derivative of omega. So once you've got angular acceleration, there's something called tangential acceleration. So if this particle going around in a circle it has angular acceleration alpha, then it has linear acceleration in meters per second squared of a sub t tangential is r times alpha. So if a whole object it has some angular acceleration alpha, points on that object will have the same uh, value of alpha, but their uh, tangential acceleration will increase. It'll start at zero at the center and increase as you go upwards. And then don't forget that there's still centripetal acceleration. We've studied this before. Any particle that's just uh, moving in a, in a circular path will have uh, centripetal acceleration, which is, I guess, r, radial acceleration, same thing as centripetal, means it's going towards the center of the circle, and that's a v squared over r. And uh, you can work it out that in terms of angular velocity omega, it's omega squared times r. So now, 
the actual acceleration is along this diagonal. If you have an object that is both rotating and has angular acceleration, that means there'll be tangential acceleration, so it's speeding up here, plus uh, the uh, radial acceleration. These are two components of the actual acceleration, which uh, is neither towards the center of the circle nor tangent. It's, it's along this diagonal. Okay, so when you have rotating objects, you can use those kinematics equations uh, analogously to how we did linear kinematics. You apply the same equations, but just every time you see an x, you replace it with theta, the position, um, angular position. Every time you see v, you replace it with the angular velocity. Every time you see a acceleration, you replace it with the angular acceleration. So for example, here's our definition of average speed is one half of the uh, initial plus the final speed. Well, now the average angular velocity is one half of the initial plus the final angular velocity. Uh, the final speed is the initial speed plus uh, acceleration times time. Final angular velocity is the initial angular velocity plus alpha times time. Uh, there's your x equals initial position plus v times t plus one half at squared. You get the same equation for something that's rotating. Final angular position is initial angular position plus the initial angular velocity time, times t plus one half alpha t squared. And if you want to get the final velocity in terms of uh, distance traveled, there's your linear equation. Your angular equation is, I guess, the final rotational or, or angular velocity is the initial uh, squared is the initial angular velocity squared plus two times the angular acceleration times the change in angular position. Okay, so next section, 10.2, uh, is on torque. Torque is the tendency of a force to cause rotation, and it depends on how big the force is, uh, the direction in which the force acts, and the point at which it is, it is applied on an object. And it's important if you're installing a, sp a spark plug on your car or tightening a, a bolt to a certain, uh, a certain amount, you can use a torque wrench, which reads torque in foot-pounds. So the SI unit of torque is actually Newton meters, Newtons times meters. The equation for torque is Rf sine theta, and as an example, we'll draw it on this uh, on this meter stick. So you're holding it here, so there's sort of a pivot point there. Uh, this mass is pulling the meter stick downwards with some force F. Uh, there's some distance right there, R, from the pivot point. Okay, and the the angle theta is actually the angle between R and F. So if you can continue going along R. And this is the angle theta right there. And so uh, if here is sine theta is about uh, theta is about 90 degrees, so sine theta is 1. So it's just r times f is your torque. So the torque will be greater as you get longer r. And so and r is sometimes r times sine theta is sometimes called the lever arm. So Here's a situation where you're, you're trying to tighten a bolt, so you want it to turn counterclockwise like that. You apply a force in this direction. Uh, here's your theta, would be right there. Your lever arm uh, is this distance r, whoops, from here to here is called r, so from right there to the pivot, it's called r. r sine theta turns out to be right here. This is your lever arm. And that's less than the length of the handle because you're not pulling perpendicularly to the handle. Uh, if you want your lever arm to be the same as the length of the wrench, you pull perpendicularly. That's going to that's gonna maximize your lever arm, so it'll maximize your torque. And actually, there is a way to get even more torque than that. You could increase your lever arm by putting a pipe in the end of your wrench, which extends this lever arm. And now if you pull perpendicularly, you can get even more torque on this bolt. You have a really, really sticky bolt. So let's see if you've got it. Here are three uh, figures. They all apply a hand applying a force to a wrench, and it's the same force. So which one of these forces will actually give zero torque? Press pause, think about that, and then I'll resume. OK, I uh, hope you got C. So here the idea is that the force is in the same direction as R. So theta equals zero, so sine theta actually equals uh, zero as well. So there's zero torque. Um, and the other way of looking at that is that the lever arm uh, would be zero in this case. 
Okay, next section 10.3 is on rotational inertia. So an object that's rotating about an axis, like this flywheel or something, tends to remain rotating about the same axis with the same angular velocity, omega, unless it's interfered with by some external influence like an external torque. Okay, so that's sort of like Newton's first law for rotation. Something that has uh, angular velocity omega will tend to have constant angular omega unless acted upon by an external torque. So the property of an object to resist changes is called its rotational inertia. There's a symbol for that, I, rotational inertia, and the SI unit of rotational inertia is kilograms times meters squared. Uh, rotational inertia depends on the mass of the object and also the distribution of mass around the axis of rotation. So, for example, here's a, a dumbbell where the mass is, is close to where your hand is, where you're trying to rotate it, that's easy. If you put these masses further away from your hand, it becomes more difficult to twist that, and you can actually uh, test that yourself. The greater the distance between an object's mass and the uh, and concentration on the axis, the greater the rotational inertia. So it's like the rotational analog of mass. Here's another thing. Rotating this uh, this baton around around its axis is easy because all the mass is around the axis. If you turn it on its side and go around your head, it's harder to spin up. It's harder to give it angular acceleration. So here's a new equation. The net torque on an object, I should put a little net there, okay, is equal to the rotational inertia times uh, alpha. So this looks like, looks like uh, F net is equal to M times ac linear acceleration. So that's the linear analog for this equation. Uh, F is analogous to torque, M is analogous to rotational inertia, and A is analogous to, uh, to alpha. Okay, so finding rotational inertia, it turns out the rotational inertia of a particle, a distance r away from the axis, and the mass m, is m times r squared. If you have several particles, like this, um, I don't know what it is, the, this thing that has m1, m2, m3, then you sum up uh, over all the individual particles of m, m1 times r1 squared plus m2 times r2 squared plus m3 times r3 squared. See if you've got that. Consider the dumbbell here in the figure. How would its rotational inertia change if the rotation axis were the center of the rod? So right now, the rotational axis is, uh, is a quarter of the distance. These are two equal masses. Uh, it's a quarter of the distance away from one and three quarters of the distance away from the other. If you then shifted the rotation axis to the center, uh, would it increase, decrease, or remain the same? I'll let you think about that and I'll resume. Okay, so actually this was a pretty tough one. Um, I won't fault you for guessing wrong. If you guessed B, that the uh, rotational or inertia would decrease, then you're absolutely correct. You must have really good uh, intuition about this. But let's work it out. So I1, as it's shown there, is going to be m times l over 4 squared plus m times 3 quarters l squared. So the two masses, uh, you square the 4, you get 16. You square 3 over 4, you get 9 sixteenths. Uh, it's all times ml squared, 10 sixteenths, and that's equivalent to 5 eighths ml squared. That's in this configuration. The other configuration, I2, will be when you put the rotation axis right in the center there. So that's L over 2 from the left mass and L over 2 from the right mass. Those and so you do m times L over 2 squared plus m times L over 2 squared. Uh, that's ml squared over 4, two of those. Add a quarter plus a quarter, you get a half, so it's a half ml squared. And then we compare uh, before to after. Uh, so 5 eighths we know is a little bit greater than a half. So that means that I2 is a little bit less than I1. So I has decreased a little bit here. Okay, so uh, if you have continuous matter as opposed to a bunch of uh, point particles, the rotational inertia is given by an integral. Uh, it's the integral over the whole volume of r squared times dm, where r is the distance of the mass element dm from the rotation axis. So this turns out to be easy if, for example, you have a thin ring or a hollow cylinder. All of these little dms are at the same exact distance r 
from the rotation axis as long as this is a very thin uh, uh, thin ring or a very very uh, thin cylinder and so when you do the integral of, of r squared uh, dm the uh, r is, can is constant so it comes out and you just got the integral over all the volume of dm which gives the total mass so it's the total mass times this radius squared if you have something where the dms are all at different distances uh, then you have to actually perform the integral. So example 10.5 says find the rotational inertia of a uniform narrow rod of total mass m and length l about an axis through its center and perpendicular to the rod. So we can write down our equation for moment of inertia. It's the integral of r squared dm over the volume. Here r is going to be x, uh, the distance from this axis. A x will go from negative l over 2 up to positive l over 2. Uh, and we know that the ratio of this little dx to total length is going to be equal to the ratio of that little mass dm to the total mass. Rearranging that, we get dm is m over l times dx. So now we're ready to uh, plug in. Integral from negative l over 2 to plus l over 2 of x squared times dm, which is m over l dx. We can now pull out the constant factor of m over l. Integral of x squared turns out to be uh, x cubed over 3. We'll evaluate that from negative L over 2 to positive L over 2. So it's M over L times L over 2 cubed over 3 minus negative L over 2 cubed over 3. Remember, the cube of negative L over 2 is going to be negative L over 8, L cubed over 8. So the negatives cancel, you get a plus, and you get L cubed over 4 over 3, which is L cubed over 12. So ML cubed over L times 12 is uh, one twelfth of ml squared. And that's exactly what it says in this table in your book, thin rod rotating about the center. So in all of these equations, it looks like you've got the total mass of the object times the, the length of the object or some size of the object squared, maybe it's the diameter or something, uh, and then there's a factor out in front, a dimensionless ratio. So another one would be th uh, the thin rod rotated around its end. Uh, again, that's ml squared, but now the factor out in front is a third. So a third's much greater than a twelfth because much more of the mass now is further away from the axis when you rotate it around the end of the rod. Uh, we've got the disc. So uh, we had hoop was mr squared. If you have a solid disc, now we're much more masses towards the center. It's a half mr squared. Uh, solid sphere, you can do this integral, it turns out to be two-fifths of the total mass of the sphere times r squared, that's if this mass is totally filled. If it's a hollow spherical shell, like a ping-pong ball, then it turns out to be two-thirds times mr squared, which is bigger than two-fifths because more of that mass, I guess, is kind of further away from the axis. Okay, so par a parallel axis theorem is saying that if we know the rotational inertia I sub C M about an axis that goes through through the center of mass of a body, then the the uh, rotational inertia around an axis that's parallel to that is I C M plus M times D squared, where uh, D is the distance from the center of center of mass axis to this new parallel axis, and M is the total mass of the object. So it looks like this. If you've got a sphere, a solid sphere, you know rotating it about its, uh, about its center is two-fifths mr squared. That's, uh, that's known from your table. What if you were asked what is the moment, the rotational inertia of a sphere uh, rotated around its edge? Okay, so an axis right touching its edge. Well now the distance of this axis from the old axis, D, is equal to capital R, so it's going to be 2 fifths mr squared, that's the original rotational inertia, plus m times d squared, or m times r squared. So you've got uh, 2 fifths plus 1 is 7 fifths mr squared. Okay, and so lastly, there's a couple of pages on rotational dynamics in this chapter. And basically, if you know a body's rotational inertia, you can use this rotational analog of Newton's second law to determine its behavior. 
uh, and we can find its rotation, its angular acceleration, and we can find its motion, right? So let's do an example. It's example uh, 10.8 in your book called Rotational Dynamics Despinning a Satellite. So you've got a cylindrical satellite 1.4 meters in diameter, meaning that its uh, radius is 0 0.7 meters. Uh, it has a mass of 640 kilograms distributed uniformly, so it's like a solid disk. Satellite is spinning at initial 10 RPM, but must be stopped. So its final uh, omega-2 is going to be zero. Two small gas jets, each have force shown there in the diagram of uh, 20 newtons, are mounted on opposite sides of the satellite and fired uh, tangent to the satellite's rim, I guess as shown there. How long must the jets be fired in order to stop the satellite's rotation? You're trying to find the time. Okay, so when you're adding torques, you have to draw what's called an extended free body diagram. So the object is now a, a big object, it's a circle in this case. There's a force on the right, we'll uh, show that going up, and a force on the left going down. Uh, its radius is r, so they're both the distance r from the center. Uh, we have to define plus torques. Positive torques will define to be counterclockwise. So, and there's this angle of that force is 90 degrees relative to the radius. So the torque for the one on the right is plus r times f. The torque for the one on the left is also plus r times f. They're both counterclockwise, so they're both positive. So when you add those up, the net torque of the two forces are this 2 times r times f. And now we're going to use Newton's second law uh, for rotation, which is uh, tau net equals i times alpha. Um, I is the moment of inertia now of a solid disk, which we can look in our table as a half mr squared. So we can solve this for alpha to find how fast it's accelerating. It's tau net over i. That's uh, 2rf, which we found, divided by 1 half mr squared. Sorting that out, we get 4 uh, times f over mr. Plugging in all our numbers, it's 4 times 20 newtons divided by 940 kilograms. Uh, and the radius is 0.7 meters, I get 0.126 radians per second squared is the angular acceleration. And now uh, we want to use kinematics. So let's convert our omega-1 to SI units. Remember it was RPM. 10 RPM is 10 revolutions per minute. We want to multiply by uh, 2 pi radians per revolution and then multiply that by uh, 1 minute uh, per 60 seconds. So minutes cancels. Minutes, uh, revolutions, cancel revolutions, I get that 1.05 radians per second. Remember, our omega-2 is 0, so let's use uh, that omega-2 is equal to omega-1 plus alpha times t and solve that for t. I got t is omega-1 minus, omega-2 minus omega-1 over alpha, and I solve that out, plug in our numbers, and I get 8.6 seconds. So that's it for example 10.8. The next example, 10.9, is into the well. You've got a solid cinder, cylinder connected by a rope that's wrapped around the cylinder to a bucket that falls down the well. I'm not going to do that example, but it is a good one. Um, you've got now two objects, one and having linear acceleration. So there's a, uh, there's a free body diagram there, and there's an extended free body diagram for the thing that can rotate. And uh, so I would definitely try that if you have a chance. Um, otherwise, I will see you in class.